Welcome to the Project Zion podcast. This podcast explores the unique spiritual and theological gifts Community of Christ offers for today's world. Hello and welcome to the Project Zion podcast. I'm your host, Carla Long, and today I'm back with two of your numero uno favorites, Charmaine and Tony. Hello, Charmaine. Hello, Tony. (laughs) Hello. Good to be here with you. Good to be with you, Carla. You are listening to Percolating on Faith, and today we're asking a question uh, as our topic, and I'm really excited about this one. It's something that we've talked about before in the past, but we're going to kind of talk about it in a different way today. And if you are a member of Community of Christ, you've probably been asked this question by somebody in your life or heard of this question being asked, Mm -hmm. at least. The question we will be discussing today is, how can you be Christian and LGBTQIA plus accepting? So it's a, it's a big question. It's a big, big question. And I, we talked a little bit earlier listeners about how we wanted to talk about this. And what we talked about is there's a lot of assumptions behind this question. When someone asks you that, they, you know, remember when the Pharisees like went after Jesus and they expected (laughs) Jesus to answer in a certain way. That's what I feel like is happening when this question is being asked. How can you be Christian and LGBTQIA plus accepting? So can we first talk a little bit about those assumptions that might be behind that and, and why somebody would even be asking? Right. And, and just to clarify, I think we're going to be answering that question as if it's being asked of the church. How can you be part of, of, of a church that is LGBTQIA plus uh, accepting? Does that, that work okay for you, Carl? Absolutely. Thank you for the okay. clarification. I think that's good. Really but I think where we start with assumptions are some of those that are just floating around in our culture that we may or may not always recognize. And, and one of them is that somehow a church is all about rules and you decide which church you're going to go to by which rules you really want to, to keep. Um, and so that's quite often what people think of is that a church has rules. And so there, therefore there must be a thou shalt not kind of long list of rules. And people tend to think that whatever's on their long list of thou shalt nots is on every Christian's list of thou shalt nots. But there's really two presuppositions there. The one first is that the questioner knows what all Christians should think or what their those rules are that everybody should be that should be on everybody's list. And then the presupposition that that's what churches are about. And and that's um, that short changes all churches, I think. Um, because what if you shifted and said, a church is not about telling you what rules you have to keep or not keep uh, in order to be good with God and cut that part out completely and say, churches are about helping you know God's love for you. The churches are about <laughs> creating these places, these opportunities where every person can know that they are of worth that they are loved by God and they're called by God to live life fully. Wow. That's a completely different place to start. Yeah. Amen. That was a great podcast. Thank you, Charmaine. (laughs) Thank you, Tony. Great job. I mean, see you later. That is the beginning and end of it, isn't it? Like churches should be a place where you know God's love done and done. I I think that's such a brilliant place to start. Yeah. So that's, you know, that's a a presupposition to undo and once you do start undoing that, you're changing your image of what God is, and you're changing your image of what a church's role or purpose is. It's not to prejudge everybody. You know, it's like, because isn't that what happens? Churches end up saying, some churches end up saying, you know, if you do this or that, God can't accept you. And, you know, you should the whole, you should die for your sins, but Jesus is going to do it for you. It doesn't leave any room for Mm -hmm. a God who, and and this is, you know, my deepest belief. And I always kind of set it up as a question. What if what God wants most is to be in relationship with us? 
and wants us to know our worth and our purpose in in life. What if that's yeah. what it all comes down to? So anyhow, that's yeah, that's I mean, the presuppositions that I kind of see. I I hear that question and I you know following up on that, uh, there's a presupposition in the question about what Christianity is, right? And the assumption is that Christianity is a single thing. Mm. Uh, and that's simply a, a false assumption. Christianity is, is many different responses to the person of Jesus. There's also an assumption in, in that question that, uh, assumption about what, about what the good news is about, mm. right? And so uh, the assumption behind it is that Christian faith is first about behavior, right? Or about the things, the th following the the things you should do, the things you shouldn't do. Right? Once upon a time in the community of Christ, that list included real church members don't dance, they don't <laughs> play cards, they don't go to saloons, they don't go to the theater, and so on. They don't drink coffee. They don't drink coffee. Or tea. They they don't mow their lawns on Sunday. Seriously. Uh, so the sun. The, the, the question assumes that Christianity is about a list, but that would not be a community of Christ current assumption. Instead of, instead of the starting point being things you must and must not do, what if Christianity is first about a gift, right? That what precedes everything else is the gift of divine love and acceptance in Jesus Christ. And, I'll just, I'll name my source here. I'm, I'm channeling Paul Tillich on this. Tillich, Tillich says this some, in one of his writings somewhere. Sorry, I can't exactly <laughs> pinpoint it. It's whether it's in the Systematic Theology or some other book he wrote. Um, oh, Tony, I'm so, just so embarrassed for you. I know, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> the exact page number. I'm so sorry. <laughs> somewhere, Tillich says, the gospel is always first about a gift before it is ever about a demand. And so much of American Christianity has reverted that order so that it's always about a demand. Our church demands that you do this, 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 and don't do this, 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 and this, and then you're Christian. It's like, uh, gracious, it's too bad Jesus didn't know that because he would never have had anybody <laughs> eating at his table with him. <laughs> right? So no, nowhere in the Gospels does Jesus say, before, before you can come have dinner with me, you got to clean up your act. Or you have to be this or not this and so on. So um, the, the assumption behind the question is, in my view, it's a false assumption about what Christianity is, but it it's a, an assumption constantly perpetuated in American religion that that Christianity is first about uh, a whole things, a, a whole list of things you shouldn't do and must do. Uh, and the 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 gift the gift is only a prize you get for having all the right answers there you know and so it's like no absolutely not i mean we are such a transactional culture i mean yeah. you don't get anything for free you know uh, yeah, but no free lunch no free lunches around here but you do you really yeah. do you get the best yeah. thing for free exactly so i think that's such a beautiful way to put it that it's a gift it is a gift freely given we want you to take it. We want you to accept it. And then there's not a lot, a lot coming on the back end. So right. that's a really beautiful way of putting it. Yeah. And Any then the other, Oh, go ahead. And, and then, and just to follow that is then, and then the response of the receiver is, is from the heart, from the, from, from their life, um, you know, of wanting to share that love to wanting to share that acceptance, to wanting to share that value, uh, self-valuing with others so that they, can know mm -hmm. that they are loved by God, mm -hmm. that they are loved by others, that they have worth. So it's it becomes a natural way of of things spreading. Uh, there's also an assumption in that question that that Christianity is a destination at which the person asking the question has arrived. Ooh. It's like uh, no. Uh, what if what if let's switch that around? What if Christianity is about a journey we're all on, right? And nobody's arrived there yet. I mean, I think I could actually support that with a quote from Philippians, maybe, or something like that. So, so just just so you know, Carla, I could Philippians three, but I, we won't get into that right now. But I'm saying um, 
that that question assumes that the asker has some sort of moral yes. superiority, mm-hmm. some sort of uh, having arrived in some sort of sort of perfection that allows them to be able to to say, uh, well, I, abs- I, I know for sure that so and so hasn't arrived because they're this or this or this. Uh, false assumption. Yeah, um, that actually. Rem- you know, every time I hear a question like that, I almost always think about, and this might be wrong, and I think this is where you're kind of where you're going, the self-esteem <clears throat> of the person asking. Like they're feeling a little bit less than in some way and somehow. And so they need to make sure other people feel a little bit less than as well. I could be completely wrong about that. That's usually the first place I go to, though. And I'm like, uh-huh. ooh, what are they lacking, you know, in in their lives? What are they what are they stressed out about that they have to try and attack me for my beliefs mm-hmm. I, in order I, in order for them to feel okay because yeah. if you're below them if you're of less rightness than them then yeah yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. i i think nice. also behind that question certainly in american culture right now there's a a whole a whole set of wrong assumptions about sexual orientation right that uh, well, gosh, we just, uh, this will date this podcast, but that's okay. We just, we just heard a nominee for the Supreme Court, un, without even flinching, refer to, uh, you know, LGBTQ, et cetera, people as having, as, as following a sexual preference, preference. and had to be corrected to by say, a senator. No, this is about orientation. This is not about preference. And so, the, so there's this, this false assumption about gender, sexuality, sexual orientation that's built into the question, right? The way the way you've phrased it to us, you know, how can you be Christian and LGBTQIA plus accepting? Um, it's the, the assumption behind the question then is that those people are sinners mm-hmm. in a very specific way, and we're not. And it's like, uh, where did you get that assumption? What's the basis of that assumption? And I guess that leads to another false assumption that's built into the question about scripture, about what, what scripture is, you know, like mm-hmm. there may be there may be the assumption behind it that, well, scripture teaches X, this, Y, this, and, this, this, and, and Z, and therefore you, you know. <laughs> so actually, Carla, that's one of the things that um we wonder if it would be helpful to to just have some uh links that are associated with this one that that talk kind of look at some of those things like what are the scriptures that often get used? Um, so anyhow, we can, if you think that would be helpful, we'll absolutely that to you. I think that would okay. be really helpful for yeah. a lot of people. And then, and then there are some scriptures, some community of Christ scriptures that I think really address this as well. And in sections 163, 164, and 165, especially, but um, we can send those, the different verses that we may or may not use <laughs> as we're talking about this, but ones that are, are good to know are there because they yeah. help us to to see how how deeply this is built into who we are as a church now. So, absolutely, mm-hmm. absolutely. So we we've talked about the assumptions behind this question, which I think is a really really important place to start because I because like sometimes when you feel attacked by things like that you just your mind just goes crazy and like you yes. can't do but that's a really important place to start <laughs> or or your fists you just clench your fists or, or your jaw and, and, and you're, you're like just, i oh. can't believe you're asking me this <laughs> um so can we talk a little bit about you know now how to answer that question uh i think it's i think that it's really important to maybe have a few things in your back pocket <laughs> so you know that so they know you've been thinking about it and you know they know that you've been praying about it so how do we even answer that question if someone asks us that? yeah hmm. there's there's different different angles you can approach the question from and uh one one angle is with a device we use in theology classes all the time uh, to help students start thinking about their theological frameworks. And that's the thing we call the quadrilateral, those four four voices of theology. So Carla, if you'd like to, oh, you're already on it. You're on it, Carla. Cool. Yeah, the, those four voices of Christian theology, scripture, reason, experience, and tradition. So, so um, just a brief description of each of these. We would say, first of all, that these four voices are part of anybody's theology. These are the the pieces that help create a theology. 
different people uh, weight these in different ways. So for some, scripture might be more important or reason or experience or tradition. So everybody's just a little bit different on that. But um, one of the things that we would reinforce is the idea that all of them are necessary. So just um, a brief description of each of them. Scripture, those writings that over time have become um, have, have been given authority or become sacred for a particular group of people. Uh, reason, the use of the analytical mind, the, of questioning, um, of intellect, uh, incorporating science and other tools in the world as we um, think about things. Tradition, those things that have been passed on to us. So um, things like hymnody, things like how we interpret scripture, things like sacraments, um, little things that we might take for granted, like that there's a Sunday school, you know, that there's a Sunday school program. That's not always been the case, but these are things that have been passed on to us that shape our understanding of, the, of Christianity or the Christian life. And then there's experience. And experience here is not just talking about my own experience. It's talking about the experience of the culture that I'm a part of. And that includes the language that I use to try and communicate or that's, that is communicating to me uh, who I am or who God is or um, what our relationships are about. So an experience can be our spiritual experience, but it's also... Um, our, our lived experience, um, the, the aspects of the culture that, that influence us. Um, so those are the four basic things. Each of them has an important role to play in a theology. And so one of the things we're, we would like to do is just kind of take a look at each of those four voices and say, how do we as a church see those voices as encouraging um, an acceptance of all people, uh, acceptance of diversity, whether that be in, in ethnic background, whether that be in how someone identifies uh, in gender or sexuality, all, you know, all of those kinds of things. So... Where would you like to start? I think we should, probably should start with the elephant in the room one, scripture. The scripture one, yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and so... Uh, with Since the, that's the one that you, yeah. is most often weaponized right. um, in, uh, in discussions about uh, sexual orientation or gender identity. And so there's different ways to come at that. One, one is, is the big picture way, which is to recognize that nobody uses everything in scripture because for our, for the sake of this conversation, the Bible is not a book. It's a library of books. It says many different things, sometimes about the same topic. And so in order to quote scripture on a topic, you have to have already picked out certain verses. And then the question becomes, how are you actually interpreting them or reading them? But I, I always love this great quote from, uh, the British poet Coleridge. We use it all the time with with our students, both undergraduate and graduate students. Um, so anyone listening to the podcast may have heard it. Many they times. may have, but <laughs> it's okay. But, but it's not, but it's on the test, so it's good for you to hear it <laughs> it's again. On the so, test. <laughs> so the quote is simply that Christianity is found in the Bible, but not everything in the Bible is Christian. And so, in other words, we have to make as readers of Scripture determinations about what we will use and what we won't use what we will apply, what we won't apply. And then we have to decide what methods we'll use to do the understanding and application. Um, one, should, one, one should think that most readers of the Bible today would, would, would not believe that slavery is a practice that is ethical. In fact, it's a, a practice that's abhorrent. And so many parts of the Bible uh, condone and enjoying slavery. So we, we automatically know through our cultural experience, through interpreting the larger story of the Bible, um, you know, through reason and tradition, we already know that 
there's those are parts of the Bible that don't apply to us today. Yeah. And so that's 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 the big the big picture view. And then also part of the big picture view is for us as Christians, the heart of the the heart of the Bible is not a text, it's a person. It's Jesus. Je- Jesus himself, who is not for Christians just a figure from the past, but a living presence. That's the heart of what scripture is all about. So in other words, you have to for, certainly for a community of Christ, we're going to interpret scripture uh, scripture as a whole in light of who Jesus is and what he called us to do and be. And there's another element here that I think is really crucial, and that is that in community of Christ, we don't, at least in our official theology, there are individuals who might think otherwise, but we we don't believe that scripture is like dictated by God but that these are individuals over time, uh, different times in the long history of humanity, who are trying to write down their perception of God, their experience of God in their time with their understandings, which are often very different from ours as far as how the world works and, and things. But they're trying to write down, pass on their experience of God. And uh, that unfortunately there's this this is one of the biggest ways that scripture gets weaponized is to say to assume that scripture says is the same as god says and so then you can take these little pieces of scripture from other times and places where the the understanding of the world and human relationships is completely different and you try to use it today to judge other people. Um, so, so I think that's a really important piece is that we don't see scripture as somebody just automatically writing down what, what came directly from God. In fact, most of the biblical authors don't in any way insinuate that that's why they're writing. There's a very there's a few exceptions where that's the case. Um, parts of the book of Revelation are, you know, the, the spirit says to write. Um, we've, we've just been doing a class on the book of Revelation. So. But it's fresh but, in our minds. <laughs> yes. But most of the other books that that's not the premise at all. Um, it's a very different purpose. So that's a, an assumption we have to to put aside um, that I just want to say we're putting aside <laughs> But at least so that there's not that assumption that somehow God said everything that's in the Old Testament and New Testament. And uh, we therefore can, because that's really an underlying part of any of our explanations of those passages that do get used. Um, yeah. And, 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 oh, wait, Carla. Yeah, sorry. Can I quote you two at one point? So I think in class, <laughs> when I had you in class, Oh, so many decades ago. Um, <laughs> I, I, this has stuck with me. You said something like the Bible doesn't say anything. The Bible does not have a mouth. <laughs> and yes, that has exactly. stuck with me really hard. And I think I've quoted you multiple times without giving <laughs> any credit at all. <laughs> so let um, me, let me, let me help you with the footnote on that. Please. That's, that's us quoting the, the Protestant theologian, Paul Van Buren. He says that in volume one of his four volume. So I, I could almost give you the page number, but I can't quite see it. But it's in volume one of his his book, his his four part book, The Theology of the Jewish Christian Reality. The Bible does not have a mouth. <laughs> right. <laughs> but I interrupted you, Tony. Please go ahead. I don't oh, know. If you're no. Are we going to go into some of the scriptures? I just was going to mention. So on this on on this particular, I even hate to use the word issue, but on questions of sexual identification, gender identification, and so on. First of all, the Bible doesn't know anything about sexual orientation, orientation. and gender identification because it had no it had no what concepts for that. But there's there's like seven passages in the whole Bible that have typically been used, uh, have typically been misused and weaponized on this particular issue. And sometimes a person asking the question you've posed to us would have one of them in mind. There's three potential passages in the Hebrew Bible and then what, four in the New Testament. In, in every case, we could show and we have shown 
uh, that being attentive to context, literary and social historical and language, what the words actually mean in Hebrew or Greek doesn't really uh, yield anything like uh, a, a way to address our current understanding of gender orientation at all. Right. And so that's a, that's a link we can, we can have you put up with this podcast, Carla, that the link to yeah. a, 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 a lecture Charmaine and I gave several years ago on those specifically on those passages, walking through them. So. Right. And, and the, the question always when looking at these passages um, and the specific circumstances in which we were looking at these passages was um, in regard to homosexual relationships. And so what we were saying, if this was when the church was trying to decide, you know, uh, will we allow ministers to perform same gendered uh, marriages? And will um, people who are gay or lesbian in a, in a same gendered relationship uh, be considered for priesthood ministry within the church in a, in a committed same sex relationship? And so one of the things that we started with, and this I think is the question that really has to you have to take into this kind of an exploration is, is what we're talking about, which in this case was committed, mutual, loving, supportive, um, relation, committed monogamous relationships. Um, is this, is this scripture talking about that? Cause that's what we're talking about. We're talking about our people in this kind of a relationship, um, going to be accepted, embraced, um, affirmed, and called within this denomination. And so that was the question we we took. It doesn't show up in, in the, in the uh, little thing, the class that Tony was talking about, as much as I wish it were. But before each of those, uh, those pa passages, we need to say, what we're talking about is mutual, loving, all of those things, relationships. Is that what this passage is talking about? And it, yeah. in none of the cases, is it? And so we're talking, what scripture is talking about is something completely different from what, what we're talking about. Um, in, yeah, we try to show in, that, in the, that class that in pretty much every case of those, that very tiny handful of things in the Bible, in virtually every case, What's being what's 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 being talked about there is sexual exploitation and abuse. Nothing has nothing to do with orientation, with uh, commitment, with loving relationships, and so on. And so uh, that that can be demonstrated from the literary historical context and from the language and from the things we know about ancient culture. So, but but that would be worth worth. Uh, listeners watchers of this this podcast going back and taking a look at to to know how to approach each of those scriptures i'm so glad you use the the c word context yeah oh, um, that one <laughs> uh, i mean it is it drives me absolutely crazy that we as 21st century americans think that we know exactly what a first century or before person in the middle east was even thinking or what they were like i barely understand my neighbors you know like <laughs> how can i understand um someone that lived over two thousand years ago in a completely different culture like it drives me crazy that we think that we understand exactly what the bible means in our first readings like oh i get it we're done ah right. no right. you don't i promise you don't i and carl i've been married to a canadian for almost 40 years and there are things <laughs> about the canadian context that i'm still learning <laughs> um amen <laughs> that's right you, you have a similar situation <laughs> yes yes and i think again that's another one of those assumptions about scripture that we have if you're going to be an honest reader of the bible you have to let go of and that is that it was written for us it was not written for us these are are things that were written over millennia and they were written for the people in their time. They've turned out to be wonderful meeting places to, for other people to come and meet God in. 
because that's what they're doing. They're trying to point to God. And so if we let their pointing to God inspire us to look for God, then, then scripture is a good meeting place, but they weren't written for us. So that, you know, there's a, then there's this larger hermeneutical or interpretative question there. Will we let scripture be a means of enhancing and enriching human life and relationships, or will we, will we turn scripture into what one feminist scholar calls texts of terror that we terrorize the, those people with whoever uh, we decide those people, whoever we decide, we, we have to decide how we will use scripture. And often behind that question you, you pose is a previous decision that scripture is going to be used to terrorize some people. And so community of Christ just simply rejects that we, as a, at least as an institution, uh, we, we reject that approach to scripture. Scripture, scripture shall not be used as a weapon, mm-hmm. shall not be used as a weapon. I, exactly. and part of me pictures someone like beating someone over the head with a Bible, like literally, but that <laughs> hurts way less than the kinds of damage that has been done to people by just by, using by, the Bible as a weapon. <laughs> yeah. And, and again, equating the words in the Bible as if that's what God thinks says how God views people and yeah. But for us as, for us as community of Christ, we could say from the scripture angle, we have recent scripture Yes, in, in terms of continuing revel, the experience that our communal experience of continuing revelation and the, the formation of re- recent scripture. We have recent sacred texts that direct us in an entirely different direction in terms of inclusion, justice, uh, compassion you and so on look at some of those yeah we actually have some on that uh, on PowerPoint. that powerpoint and so if you go to the next so the next one okay the next slide has a community how, in community of christ theology how we see divine revelation divine self-disclosure able to happen through any of these means what, that revelation comes through our scripture whether it's in that as I was describing earlier, that meeting place where we may uh, may meet God or in a community of Christ and the idea of ongoing revelation of God speaking in our time and um, the body of the church discerning whether or not this is God's voice to us. So, and that revelation is something that gives us clarity and insight in the reason part of our theology in our understanding and our um our analyzing that it that revelation comes in our tradition that there are things that have come through our tradition that continue to reveal god's nature and purpose to us and that god um god's revelation comes to us in experience um in living today in our interactions with others and to us through the spirit, sometimes quiet and gentle voice. And the, sometimes the, the kick in the butt we get uh, <laughs> from the spirit. So the revelation comes in all of these, in all of these four voices of theology. Um, and, and for us as a church, that's important because that means that we, if we're always going to be open to this kind of revelation, that there will always be room and necessity of growing and growing requires changing. And so that we can't have the answer for all time, but that um, our continuing growth and insight from God keeps us moving on. So, but some, if you'll go on down to the next one, Carla. So he, this is uh, Doctrine and Covenant section 163, verse 7. And 163 was written uh, in... 2007. Seven. Yeah. 2007. So Scripture is not to be worshipped or idolized. Only God, the Eternal One, of whom Scripture testifies, is worthy of worship. God's nature, as revealed in Jesus Christ and affirmed by the Holy Spirit, provides the ultimate standard by which any portion of scripture should be interpreted and applied. And then the next part of the paragraph C, it is not pleasing to God when any passage of scripture is used to diminish or oppress 
races, genders, or classes of human beings. Much physical and emotional violence has been done to some of God's beloved children through the misuse of scripture. The church is called to confess and repent of such attitudes and practices. And end of quote. So that's a really powerful statement to the church, to community of Christ, about how we will use scripture and not use scripture as we try to deal with all kinds of you know, complex social and ethical uh, questions. We're going to keep the image of the God whose nature is love at the center of everything we do and not try to turn uh, uh, specific passages into hand grenades that we lob, <laughs> that we lob at people, um, you know, which always will we'll do, no, we'll do nothing for Christianity, but we'll do everything against it. So that's 163. Should we go to the? Sure. It's, there's a, there's a, we have a couple more in there, Carlos. So this is so 164. this is 164, um, verse 5. It is imperative to understand that when you are truly baptized into Christ, you become part of a new creation. By taking on life and mind of Christ, you increasingly view yourselves and others from a changed perspectives. Former ways of defining people by economic status, social class, sex, gender, or ethnicity no longer are primary. Through the gospel of Christ, a new community of tolerance, reconciliation, Unity and diversity and love is being born as a visible sign of the coming reign of God. And so it's kind of starting to name very, very specifically some of the things that we have tended to use as people to divide ourselves from each other. And saying in Christ, these are no, these are no longer valid primary ways of understanding who we are in relationship to each other. And if the, just one more down there, Carla. So we're trying to do this. We're, we're quoting scripture at you, <laughs> <laughs> but we're trying to do it in the context of um, the create the, the creative process within the church as it has tried to discern what does, what is God saying to us about um our differentnesses and our samenesses <laughs> and um and in the context of the church being open to asking god asking the spirit to help us think about um some of the 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 ways in which um we have built up boundaries and barriers between each other and the the questions, the LGBTQIA questions are the ones that have drawn us into this time as a church of saying, God, help us see this in a much, in a bigger way, in a way where your love gets more room. So uh, as revealed in Christ, God, the creator of all, ultimately is concerned about behaviors and relationships that uphold the worth and giftedness of all people and that protect the most vulnerable. Such relationships are to be rooted in the principles of Christ-like love, mutual respect, responsibility, justice, covenant, and faithfulness against which there is no law. In the church, if the church more fully will understand and consistently apply these principles Questions arising about responsible human sexuality, gender identities, roles and relationships, marriage and other issues may be resolved according to God's divine purposes. Be assured nothing within these principles condones selfish, irresponsible, promiscuous, degrading or abusive relationships. Faced with difficult questions, many properly turn to scripture to find insight and inspiration. Search the scriptures for the living word that brings life, healing, and hope to all. Embrace and, and proclaim these liberating truths. So in this little passage <clears throat> has become, in many ways, the guiding principles for the church when we're talking about um, different kinds of relationships uh, that, maybe, um, that maybe have been on those lists, those churches' lists in the past. And so it's saying, you know, what makes a healthy relationship? That's what we're for, is 
relationships where there's Christ-like love and mutual respect and responsibility and justice and covenant and faithfulness. And then what are we saying isn't helpful in a relationship? You know, nothing that condones selfish, irresponsible, promiscuous, degrading, or abusive relationships. So it's using a different set of criteria, what it makes for a healthy relationship, rather than what kinds of relationships are good, or what kinds of relationships are bad, as um, sometimes judged in, in gender kinds of terms, or in sexuality, or orientation kinds of terms. Now, we could say these these texts of contemporary scripture arise out of our tradition and out of our ongoing experience. So we don't we don't treat these as like rocks dropped from heaven on us. These are there, there's an, an element of mutual discernment in this that's that's going on in the church that mm-hmm. is part that of the continuing revelation these. process. Mm-hmm. And, and and so our you know our overall approach to scripture and community of Christ and some of the questions and issues that we, we have to deal with today. Uh, it's always going to be done in the context of relationship relationality. Uh, our relationship with each other, with God, with the creation. Um, we we're not going to approach these kinds of issues with juicy little juicy little Bible quotes on bumper stickers that somehow are supposed to settle things once and for all. So I think that's really important in terms of our our use of scripture versus the kinds of uses of scripture you would see behind the question you pose to us. Mm -hmm. And I think that kind of approach that we were just looking at is also taking us very squarely into, you know, on the quadrilateral with scripture, tradition, reason, and experience. It takes us very strongly into the experience quadrant. And it's saying, what is our lived experience of what's a healthy relationship? What builds up, not what tears down. And so uh, in those cultures where we have had the the blessing of courageous people um, living out their sexuality, um, being being public and helping the the whole population, whether they want to see or not, that that the that these are loving mutual, wonderful relationships are our, our experience of other people's lives and situations is expanded. And so um, these things that are written in those few um, verses there um, are visible to us. And so you know, this is this is where scripture and experience uphold each other and where people, are able to see in in very natural ways re- these um, these responsible, loving relationships, and and then it's really very difficult. Though some people work at it hard <laughs> to to be prejudiced against, biased against uh, people. But but yeah. So this is where experience comes in to our theology as well, and we say, oh my goodness. What an amazing couple. Or look at how this person is living love in the world. Um, and then those other categories fall away because they're not relevant anymore. Um, yeah. So anyhow. So the, the actual experience with human beings in the community of Christ is, is viewed as potentially revelatory all the time. So uh, encountering real life relationships with people who are differently gender, who identify differently, in in that encounter, their humanity and our humanity become kind of uh, uh, re- reflectors mm-hmm. of the divine. And so uh, we, that's that's part of our revelatory experience as a church. And, and another piece of it would be, so this is another question that sometimes gets asked, and that is, isn't your church just giving in to culture? Isn't your, it, yes, Carlos, Carlos. <laughs> doing this, which means, yeah, she's heard Baseball. that one too. <laughs> and, and that's another cool thing, though, is that as a church, we believe that the spirit may be at work in the culture around us. And it may be helping, it often is helping us 
to, to see what our blind spots are as far as those places where we've been judging other people or where we've not made, made God's love uh, uh, free to flow. And so, um, you know, as a church, we believe God is at work in the culture. There's some parts of the culture. We always have to be discerning what parts of the culture are, again, building up and what are tearing down. But, you know, um, ordination of women would not have happened if there had not been a women's movement to, to help people see the injustices and the oppression against women. Issues of racism would not have been, have been addressed and changes would not be made, have been made, though they've not been made enough. And they, and we're at another point where that has, we have to move forward on that. Um, But if those, if the culture had not been willing to change, to see goodness, to seek goodness, um, lots of Christians would not have seen their own blind spots and see where they need to grow. So we believe God can be involved in growth, in progress, in cultures, and that we then can learn from, from what the Spirit is doing there. So that's the other, yeah, that's another element of the experience part is the cultural part. I'm, I'm so glad you, you mentioned that, Charmaine, because it's it, the divine, the divine spirit is by the testimony of scriptures in and through all things. It is working everywhere. So why wouldn't it be working in the culture? And uh, it's, 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 it's not the spirit's fault or the culture's fault that sometimes the, the church, the church has been blinded by its own certainties about its faith. Uh, so that it can't see what the spirit is doing in in culture. Um, you know, if you if you if you jab a Bible in your eyes, you can't really see very far. <laughs> and it hurts. <laughs> Don't try that at home, Carla. <laughs> Don't do that. That's a horrible idea. And you know, back to the whole experience. The experience. What we're talking about. I have found, and I could be wrong about this, but more often than not, it's experience that changes people the most. You know, if you have a son or a daughter um, who lives a different life than you had expected and you still love them and realize, oh, they're wonderful and inca- incredible people. I raised them. They're incredible people. <laughs> exactly. And that changes them the most. So that experience piece is a really, really big it piece. Really is. Uh, yeah. So I, I think that that is, yeah. I, I love that we're, we're categorizing that as revelatory, you know, like, I don't think that people would ever necessarily think that's revelatory, but it is, it is it a, absolutely, is. absolutely is. How exciting to, to <clears throat> even say that. Yeah. It's the on the othering of, you know, mm-hmm. of those that when we tend to build up these boundaries and have us and them, us and the other um, experience on others, us, and makes us connected. And <laughs> thanks, Carla. That was really yeah, really helpful. Tr- uh, tradition may may seem like uh, the unhelpful partner here, <laughs> but actually, yeah, I've been waiting for this one. I'm curious what you're going to say about <laughs> yeah. how how does tradition help us here? Well, it I mean it depends on what parts of tradition you're going to you're willing to look at. So. Um, If if one goes to Christian tradition, uh, looking looking for little juicy juicy bites to prove pre-existing uh, beliefs, one can find all kinds of nasty stuff. But also, if one is attentive to the voice of Christian tradition, one one can find all kinds of brilliant brilliant things across the ages that are in alignment with these principles. And so, for example. This one isn't ancient, ancient, but, you know, Bonhoeffer writing in 1937 in The Cost of Discipleship makes this statement about the doctrine of the incarnation. It is really powerful and relevant to us on this topic today. And so the incarnation is a Christian doctrine, though it's rooted in the Gospel of John. Uh, The Gospel of John doesn't use the word. Christian tradition developed the word incarnation to talk about the divine word becoming flesh and dwelling among us. And there's all kinds of reflections across the centuries about what that, what that really means about how that, how the incarnation reveals divine, divine love and care for the world and so on. But Bonhoeffer makes this statement in 1937. And remember, he's a German theologian working. He's, he's guiding an underground illegal seminary 
because the Nazis have shut have have shut down have, have shut down seminaries that are not going to support Nazi ideology. So he's trying to teach. Uh, uh, in this case, it was young men and a couple of women who were part of it. Uh, things about ministry uh, on the QT. The Gestapo finally shut it down. But in his book, Cost of Discipleship, he makes this statement where he says, you know, in the incarnation, Christ took on the human form. Christ, uh, Christ in, in, his hum, in his humanity and lowliness became every one of us. Every one of us is, is represented in the incarnation. And then Von Effer goes on to make the next really radical statement an attack on any human being is therefore an attack on Christ. And what he was thinking about in 1937 was the Nazi attack on Jews, on using the Nazi word homosexuals, on gypsies, on anybody who was not Aryan. And Bonhoeffer uses the doctrine of the incarnation to say wrong, wrong, wrong. The incarnation is a representation of Every human being, no exceptions, in the person of Christ. And therefore, to, to attack, assault, abuse, verbally abuse other human beings is to do the same thing to Jesus. I think that's a, a, brilliant, a, a brilliant use of tradition on the part of Bonhoeffer that's very applicable to the question you posed yeah. to us. So another piece that would be tradition, and and we can plot this back to the Old Testament as being one of those themes that God cares about, and that is for those who are most vulnerable and those who have been marginalized by their societies, and that that's what you speak out against. You know, that's what the, the prophets in the Old Testament are speaking out about in their time, about the people who have been treated as though they are less, as though they don't matter to God because they don't matter to the society. And so the, the idea that God's love is for them as, as is importantly as for, for everyone else who's all doing okay. In fact, that maybe God's love is even more for those who are the marginalized and the victim um, and that God has a special care. And it goes all the way back to the Old Testament prophets. And I think it's something that, well, I think Tony's going to go there next, but um, that's what Jesus was all about. And so this is, this is scripture, this is tradition, but this is also reason. If we're going to say, what does it mean to be Christian, a follower of Christ? What did Jesus do? You know, who did Jesus reach I've been Jesus waiting for the J word. I've been waiting for the people's <laughs> word. I'm, I'm, I'm here for it. Let's do it. Yeah. Go for it, Tony. Yeah, well, I mean, just following up on what Sherman is saying, I mean, we if we had time, we could work through Christian tradition across the ages and find examples again and again and again of Christians following, taking the justice path on behalf of those who are being exploited or abused in their culture and society. There were Christians in the Middle Ages who protected Jews, especially during the Crusades. And there, there, were, there were Christians when, when Christianity came to the, quote, new world. <laughs> when it, uh, there, there were some Christian thinkers who, who, in, quote, new Spain, who were appalled by the way that their own Spanish people treated indigenous folks. So we, we can find examples across the tradition of, of people who often it's a minority voice, but they're worth listening to, who uh, were very much in alignment with Jesus and the prophets in terms of how, in terms of the, the, the mandate to uh, uphold those who, whose dignity is assaulted, right? So that's pretty important. And so I guess we're, now we're coming down to the big J, right? Big right? So, J, Jesus. <laughs> you know, yeah. th th there's, the, there's the, the Jesus angle for approaching your question. And if, I mean, Christianity is ultimately connected to the person of Jesus. In however way you want to understand it, it's in some sense relatedness to Jesus as guide, as teacher, as exemplar, as savior, as redeemer, 
as Christ, whatever titles you want to use for it, Christianity ultimately comes back to the figure of Jesus in whom redemption or salvation or new life or how, new creation, whatever metaphor you want to use, is exemplified. And so how can you how can you be Christian or call yourself Christian and be LGBTQIA affirming? Well, uh, the simple answer is because it's a Jesus thing to do, right? It's it's a pretty simple it's a pretty simple straightforward answer. That is, at the heart of our faith is Jesus. Jesus welcomed everybody to the table. That's pretty much the end of the conversation. There, that's the end of the story. And if if the church wants to do what I'll use this kind of language, if the church wants to do what its Lord did, then the church must do that. There's no there's no alternative for us except <laughs> disobedience to what Jesus did, right? So uh, that's 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 the big picture. I mean, the Gospels are so full of amazing stories where where Jesus openly or subtly is, you know, uh, ta- taking the side of seeking the well-being of those who's, whom the dominant culture had crushed, suppressed, uh, pushed to the side, marginalized, etc. And so um, in this culture at present, diff- people with different gender identities are in danger. And to be a Christian is to place ourselves in, in, in a relationship with those who are endangered and to try to be the bridge, to be the helper, the healer, to be present and to make, to make space for their humanity to flourish. That, that's the Jesus thing to do. And I, I would take it another direction, too, and that is that many of the things that in some churches have been used to judge people have to do with sexuality. You know, whether it is women being treated as though they're not equal, that they can't vote, that they can't minister, that they um, shouldn't be heard, um, that it's okay to beat them because the Bible says you can't. I mean, it, whether it's that or whether it is, um, is this uh, readiness to judge people whose sexual expression or identity is different. It's like there's all of this focus on sex. And part of that comes from, you know, kind of a Puritan background and the, you know, unwillingness to talk openly about this important part of being human um and it's it's always it's always so fascinating to me you know we've we've talked about maybe there's seven um passages that are talking about homosexuality and yet in the bible there are dozens of references to those who seek wealth um the dangers of wealth the dangers of accumulating um, and in the process, ignoring the needs of others. There's, and and what does what does Jesus say about the sexual lives of people? Nothing. <laughs> he he affirms the woman at the well who's had five husbands and is living with somebody that she's not married to. He recognizes her value and we're independent of any of that. Um, you know, the, the prostitute or the, the, the woman that uh, uh, anoints his feet and uh, accepts forgiveness as a gift. Does, does, I mean, here's some of those things where the, you could say, oh, Jesus is really concerned about people's sexual lives or their sexual identity. No. And so this is another one of those places where if we're paying attention both to what Jesus did and didn't do and to that whole, the big scope of what's um, in the, the story about what God, God cares about, um, we begin to see that 
these things that people have used as judgments against each other, that's, that's our own culture's preoccupation. This is not God's preoccupation. Um, and Christ is our, is our best example of that. But hopefully the church can be an example of that going forward as well. I mean, you know, if you want to play the rhetorical game with that question, uh, how can you be a Christian and be LGBTQIA plus affirming? You can turn the question around. How can you be a Christian and support white supremacy? How can you be a Christian and support environmental self-destruction? How can you be a Christian and support the fact that most of the world's wealth is now in the hands of a few people and that the poor keep getting poor? It, I mean, you know, so if we want to, if you, if you want to play the game that way, uh, I, <laughs> there's a whole lot more support for these questions, <laughs> right? Biblically and right. experientially than how can you be a Christian and support a, the, the, the constant use of violence in, for example, in American culture. Um, so anyway, I mean, you obviously knew where we were going to come out on this. So. <laughs> no surprises. I'm sure I knew. I, I mean, I had an idea. <laughs> yeah, I had an idea. So, I mean, this has been really, really helpful. Um, if nothing else, you know, like most of the people I know and that I, um, I am associated with uh, fall on the same side as we do on, on this question. But I do think that sometimes we can't articulate it very well. And it's, it's just so helpful to have this kind of laid out and just say, this is why, this is why, this is why, this is why. And, and then say, okay, well, that makes a lot more sense to me because I, for me, I do sometimes get really tongue tied when someone's coming at me with stuff, something like that. Mm-hmm. So I just really appreciate what you have to say, uh, scripturally and, and that the Bible, the Bible as a weapon is the, yeah, like it's one of those, how could you Carla, how could you believe this and still be blah, blah, blah. Right. Right. Oh, it's so hard. Be- and, and the problem is, is that we don't have any like quick little pithy answers, right? Like <laughs> it's, it's a conversation. This yeah. is, this is how we see it because this is, yeah. this is how we understand God. Yeah. So anyway, I, I just really appreciate this whole conversation. Yeah. Well, there, there's that one passage. I can never remember it. It's, um, it's from first John about love. Oh yeah. First John four. And that's, yeah. that's my go-to if you need a little scripture is um, all who love are of God. Yeah. Yeah. And Whoever loves is born of God and knows God. Yeah. Somewhere in there. First John four, look it up, Carla. <laughs> and so, you know, if we're talking about loving relationships between people, then that's of God. And that's not a bad place to start or end, I think, in these kinds of conversations. Um, anyway. Right. If you need that pithy little answer. Like, yeah, Jesus was exactly. so good at pithy answers. <laughs> Jesus was so good at it. And I try to be like Jesus, but I just can't. I know. Me neither. I, I want to fight. So hard. I want to fight, usually. I do. Oh, it is hard. It is hard to yeah. maintain a lot of love in my So heart. maybe you could just, you know, tie people to a chair and make them watch this podcast or listen to this podcast. <laughs> what a great idea. I should tie more people to chairs. <laughs> Wait a minute. Wait a minute. There might be some violence involved there. Huh. <laughs> Well, we'll think about it. But. <laughs> okay. um, so we're almost to the end of our time, actually. Um, is there, did we, did we hit all of the points that we needed to hit? Probably not. <laughs> but they could be beginning points for a future podcast, but, but hopefully at least is an exploration of some of the places we can go with this. And, you know, we didn't really specifically say, oh, and here's the reason section, but you could hear the reason section of those four voices coming through in the, well, look at what Jesus did and how, you know, and the questions. Um, yeah, we're, we're trying, we're trying to approach it rationally. When we get to the tying people to chairs, then we've kind of stepped over the reason boundary a little far, but, but I'm not saying I'm opposed to that, Carla. I'm just... <laughs> Please, people, don't take us too seriously on this. Well, I, you know, I think that they know us pretty well by now. I, I would. So. <laughs> well, thank you both for you know just 
like I said, just kind of laying it out in a way that we can think about it. And maybe even after we listen to this podcast, we can kind of formulate our own answers and, and, and be ready to, in yeah. case somebody ever comes at us. Because actually just today on Facebook, I read a letter written to someone about having, um, um, a rainbow flag in their yard. And it was so sanctimonious uh, <laughs> and it immediately put me back. And I just wanted to say, ah! <laughs> That. That's what I usually end up saying. So maybe now I could be better at formulating a better answer. When I right. Yeah. Yeah. So. Well, we will we'll send you just a little short list of some of those scriptures, doctrine and covenants, and the a link to that link to that uh, uh, that video that we did several right. years ago on those seven texts yeah. and the First John and First John four. We can first First John 4. put that in there too. So Don't forget First John pieces. four. That's a lovely one. So I thank like you that. so much. I really appreciate it. You both. You are wonderful. And um, yeah, thanks again. Thank you. Our pleasure. Thanks for listening to Project Zion podcast. Subscribe to our podcast on Apple Podcast, Stitcher or whatever podcast streaming service you use, and while you are there, give us a five-star rating. Project Zion Podcast is sponsored by Latter-day Seeker Ministries of Community of Christ. The views and opinions expressed in this episode are of those speaking and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of Latter-day Seeker Ministries or Community of Christ. The music has been graciously provided by Dave Hines. 